In today's video, we're going to be reacting to Lane Norton's video. Stretching doesn't reduce risk of injury. So what does? Let's do it. I get a lot of questions asking about how I recovered from my injuries, what I do now to prevent injuries. Now, before I get started, I want to point out there is nothing you can do to prevent an injury. Yeah, I think that's largely really true. We can reduce our risk, but we can't truly prevent everything. But you can reduce your risk of an injury. However, if you train hard enough, long enough, the likelihood is you will get injured at some point. Yeah, sorry for stopping so much, but I think that's also very much true. Um, in weight training, there are injuries. They pop up from time to time. Your risk isn't that high, but if you do it for long enough, probably going to get hurt. That's okay. That's the nature of the beast. There's so many positives that comes with weight training, right? That is how this works. And a lot of people struggle with the concept of risk reduction versus prevention. If you don't want to get injured, don't get out of bed in the morning. But then you're going to be an immobile sloth and you'll be in pain anyway. So, Good point. Um, the rates of things like osteoarthritis are actually higher in people that are sedentary compared to the people that do like a moderate amount of activity, weight training, running, all that good stuff, right? You might as well be in pain from stuff you do at the gym that improves your life overall. Let's talk about the injuries I've gone through. Two herniated discs in my lumbar spine, two bulge discs in my lumbar spine, two herniated discs in my cervical spine, a fully torn right pectoral that required surgery in 2008, a partially torn left pectoral, partially torn left adductor, partial muscle tears in both of my hips. And yet, a few weeks ago, I squatted over 600 pounds and deadlifted over 700 pounds. How yeah, so it looks like a, a pretty big laundry list of injuries. I think if you talk to most folks that have been in the game for a period of time, myself included, I could just you know rip off 20 or 30 different injuries I've had over the past 10 to 15 years. I'm still going hard. I love training, right? The body is resilient. You can get over these things, right? But it is part of the game. How is this possible? Any one of those things, people would say, well, that's a career-ending injury. Well, we know that the human body is actually quite resilient, and I have learned so much about injuries and pain. And one of the things I learned is there is a lot of dogma when it comes to injury risk reduction. And most of the stuff that you guys think reduces your risk of injury doesn't. And Absolutely true. I feel like this has been my entire career trying to point out what actually does cause injury and also what helps people get out of pain, right? Versus what folks say online. Some of you aren't gonna like this video. The first thing, that is dogma that based on available evidence does not reduce your risk of injury stretching. Uh, whenever you get injured, the first thing people will say is they give you, get some stretches to do. Were you, were you stretched? Did you stretch before you lift? So first off, static stretching can actually reduce muscular performance, but in the systematic reviews and the randomized control trials, it is quite clear static stretching does not reduce the risk of injury. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of papers on this it doesn't matter how much you guys want it to be true i'm sorry it does not reduce injury risk yeah and that you know you can't really deny all the literature coming out that talks about static stretching not helping with reducing the likelihood of injury i will say i think this is nuanced sometimes if you look at some of these big studies they're looking at a lot of field sports where folks don't need a tremendous amount of mobility I think what happens is that people read those studies and they're like, well, stretching is useless, right? Um, but a bunch of sports, so Olympic weightlifting is a big one that I work in. Mobility is incredibly important and you need it for high levels of performance. The top competitors in the world have tremendous mobility to get into the bottom of a, let's say, overhead squat for a snatch. You need tremendous ankle, knee, hip, thoracic, shoulder mobility. And the other piece that I talk about sometimes, especially from a rehab perspective, if you're super stiff in one joint, you may end up overloading another. So I think that overall stretching, not great for preventing injuries, but keep in mind, most of this research is in field sports, not in, let's say, Olympic weightlifting, where mobility might be a little bit more important. And then people like want to throw in, well, what about these peptides? And what about taking in this? And what about doing this? Most of the things people bring up are not evidence-based ways of injury prevention. Lane, you say stretching doesn't help prevent injuries. What does? Well, there are a few things you can do that have shown significant risk reductions in the risk of injury. And one of the biggest ones is sleep. So. Yeah, highly agree, but let's see what he has to say. There was a study where they were looking at people in the army and they stratified them into people who got 
eight hours or more of sleep per night versus people who got four hours or less of sleep per night. I think it was a 235% increase in risk in people who were sleep deprived. And this is something they see consistently throughout the literature as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he's talking about military populations, but you also see this in, let's say, uh, university athletes, which I think is a pretty good population to look at because most of the folks I work with on a regular basis, they love strength, they love fitness, they love working hard in the weight room. And if you're trying to utilize a study that's looking at, let's say, elderly folks with fibromyalgia and trying to see if there's some sort of correlation between sleep and pain, which there is, that's not always very applicable, right, to the person that's in front of you or the population that you treat. But you're seeing this in the military. You're seeing this in sports. Good sign that probably most folks are active and like to train hard. There's probably a correlation between sleep and injury. People who sleep at least seven hours a night have a much lower risk of injury than people who sleep less than that. Get off your phones, stop scrolling, go to bed earlier. Now, why does sleep help with risk reduction of injury? Because most injuries occur, even acute injuries, when we are under recovered and then one, we can't execute the lifts as well as we would like and being under recovered puts you in a place where you're more susceptible to acute injury risk. That makes a lot of sense. In my mind, you basically, there's an optimal amount of training volume, optimal amount of recovery, optimal results for overdoing it in the gym. And then we're not recovering via, let's say eating well or sleeping well, more likely to hurt probably, right? So sleep obviously is going to help with recovery and that can help reduce your risk of injury. Also Amen. having a systematic sports specific warm up procedure. I'm not talking about static stretching. What I'm talking about is getting your heart rate up. Okay. Through some means and making sure you have a repeatable sports specific warm up. So what do I do? Well, if I'm going to squat or I'm going to deadlift, I hop on the assault bike for five minutes, go pretty hard. I get my heart rate up to about 170 or 180. Then I do a little bit of dynamic stretching, which is not static stretching and dynamic stretching does not negatively impact performance. So you can look up some dynamic stretches. True. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that literature, but static stretching does seem to reduce uh, power at least a little bit. Um, most of these studies are basically someone stretches right before they squat maximally, which obviously no one would ever do. Um, but even in the warm up, if you stretch first can reduce your power for a lot of athletes they are just really stiff. Let's say you can't get in the hole in the squat. I will recommend static stretching before and even between sets, just because you don't have the mobility to get where you need to. And adding that stretch, I think is worth to gain the mobility over that little reduction in power that you're getting from stretching. Before lifting, I do that for about five more minutes. And then I do a lot of submaximal warm up sets before I ever hit my top set. For example, when I squat, you guys have seen me do many squat sessions. I'll start out with 135 for three to five reps. Then I'll do 215 for two to four reps. Then I'll do 295 for one to three reps. Then I'll do 375 for a rep or two. Then I'll do 455 for a single. Then I'll do 525 for a single. And then I start whatever my working sets are. All those reps are not just helping me stay warm. They're giving me practice. They're readying myself mentally to prepare myself for the lifts that are coming. And they're helping with flexibility within the sport specific range of motion that I'm working on. Now, this is pretty interesting, right? And I agree with Lane for sure. Uh, we have a ton of research showing that specific warm ups can be helpful for injury reduction. I think a good one is maybe the Santa Monica PEP program for reducing the likelihood of ACL injuries. One of the things that always crosses my mind, though, is that is it the actual warming up? So basically going from low heart rate, low body temperature to a high body temperature that actually reduces the risk of injury. If you look at some of these specific injury prevention programs, they're doing a lot of, let's say, jumping, cutting. They're doing a lot of balance exercises that are helpful for reducing the likelihood of, let's say, an ankle sprain injury. Um, is the warm up what's actually helping people or is it just the basic movements that they're trying? And if you use those movements and just put them in your training program, right, as opposed to putting it at the start of your training program, would you get that same effect? I don't really know. Uh, largely I agree with lane. I think it's important to take small jumps. So not just going, you know, to 90% of your one rep max and doing your sets for the day. 
And I think it's probably helpful for a variety of reasons. Although just keep in mind, we don't have good research on power lifters warming up with multiple sets as opposed to fewer sets and looking at whether or not that causes an injury. I mean, logically it seems to make sense. So I think what we're doing is we're warming up the body. We're preparing the body for the lifts of the day. Um, and that may be helpful for reducing injuries. But I think the big one, at least for me, and this is what I tell my patients and my athletes is that your warm up is a really good time to figure out how your body is feeling that day. Right. So largely I'm a big fan of RPE training. I'm a big fan of basically pushing harder or less hard in the gym based on how you feel, how stressed you are, how much sleep you had. And during your warm ups, you get a good idea of how you feel. Right. So if the weights are feeling really heavy that day and you're really stressed out, haven't slept, maybe you back off that day. Right. And if things are feeling great, maybe you push ahead a little bit. Right. Uh, the other piece is that if you have a small injury, you feel starts to pop up during your warm up sets. It's another thing like, all right, I maybe need to modify a little bit. And doing those things are probably going to help you from an injury prevention standpoint. So I think that a lot of the benefits of a warm up and just taking a lot of sets are just because it allows you to make smart decisions. And if you just basically put your working set on the bar and just go for it, you don't have the opportunity to see how your body feels. You get through the set and then, you know, potentially get injured, right? Now, other things that may help as well, actually having a pretty good VO2 max seems to be associated with a reduced risk of injuries. I think a lot of this. You know, that's, that's another great point. One of the things I talk about a lot. So I know of at least one study where they're looking at VO2 max um, in soccer players. I think they also have this with Tim Gabbis research um, with rugby players, I believe. Uh, I'll put some links in the show notes so you guys can check that out. But largely VO2 max does predict risk of injury. What I will say is that that really depends on the sport, right? If you have a super high VO2 max, is that going to prevent your injuries in powerlifting? I don't think so, but maybe it would. Um, but yeah, being basically prepared for your sport, if your sport requires a high VO2 max, that makes sense. This stuff is actually secondary to people who are better recovered, have lower risk of injury. If I go back and look at where my injury problem started, they didn't start until my life hit a very, very, very stressful spot personally. When I was sleeping eight hours a night, when I was training at my favorite time of day, when I wasn't traveling a ton, and when I was making that the main focus, the amount of volume I could tolerate was insane. I could squat four times a week. I could deadlift two to three times a week. I could bench four times a week with heavy weights, high volume, because I was setting myself up to where I was recovering optimally. And then I had a very stressful point in my life. I was more stressed during the day. And we do see that stress can bleed into other areas. I was sleeping less and I was not recovering as well, but I was still trying to do the same stuff. And that is where I started getting injured and dealing with pain. Makes total sense. We see it all the time. And I think he's going to talk about this a little bit later, but stress does correlate with injuries for sure, without a doubt. And I'll say myself, probably when I started getting hurt more and more was after the birth of uh, my son. And obviously there's a lot more stress, there's less sleep. And I just felt like I was so frail. I'd go to the gym and I'd be doing less than I normally do, just getting hurt way more frequently. There's definitely something to the stress and sleep thing for sure. How did I come back from that? A lot of this stuff is load management. If you are starting to feel some pain, if you have an acute injury, a great example is in January. Talking about two things that are maybe a little bit different, but load management, super important. We'll see where it goes with that. And the other piece he's talking about is a little bit about having a current injury or prior injury uh, might lead you to have more pain in the future if you don't listen to your body. But let's see where it goes with this. January, I'm very certain I partially tore this adductor, my left adductor. I was setting up for deadlift, and of course, it was on a day after I, I've had, I'd had a few weeks of less sleep because I was traveling a lot. I had just traveled and flew up to Canada the night before, and I was trying to execute a heavy deadlift day. And what happened? I went down, did my first rep, went to do my second rep, and felt a pop in my adductor. Here's what I'll say. Six weeks later, I was deadlifting back over 600 pounds again. The first thing I did was immediately I stopped doing what I was doing. I didn't try to power through the workout but I stayed mobile. I didn't just immobilize myself. And they do show active recovery is better than passive recovery. And they also show. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, this is nuanced depending on the injury that you do have. Let's say you do have a strain injury, probably like Lane is talking about. If you do nothing, not good, right? We want to stress these things because it helps them to heal over the course of time. 
And literally, this is basically the crux of my entire business. If you get an injury, we want to keep training as much as possible. One, to maintain your fitness and maintain all the good stuff that comes with exercising. B, if you exercise appropriately, it's a positive stimulus. It can help you rehab, right? So yes, for large majority of injuries, unless there's a medical red flag, unless you fractured your spine or something like that, and obviously you want to keep going. We just have to be smart about the way we do it. So that you're better off trying to do something with weights to target the area that doesn't cause you pain that makes it worse then do nothing. But what you don't want to do is either try to go in and go heavy again, which is what I used to do, or just completely detrain. Because what happens is... Yeah, good points. And he's going into another topic a little bit, so I wanted to pause here. But yes, if you're not aware of this, uh, we have quite a bit of literature that shows that if you have a prior injury, you're more likely to have a future injury. So let's say you hurt your hip squatting and then it rehabs and feels better, we probably have to be a little cautious in the future because you're more likely to have the hip pain again, right? The other piece is that if you have a current injury, so if something is bothering you a little bit, just like Lane had with his adductor, if we blow through that pain, you have an increased risk probably of making that either worse or getting a new injury that's worse. Uh, there's a pretty good study called Do Niggles Matter? I'll leave a link in the show notes in the description. And largely what that showed is if you're a, a soccer player in this case, and you have a non-time loss injury, which means the injury is not severe enough to keep you from playing, and you play through it, your risk of having a worse injury goes through the roof. It's something like seven or eight times, right? Don't quote me on that, but it's quite a bit. So here's a, the paradox, right? The problem we have, if we blow through this pain, if we don't really respect it, we can make it worse, right? We're probably going to make it worse. If we respect it, back off a little bit, and slowly ramp up to tolerance, probably going to speed up our rehab. Right. So that's just a nuanced thing that we have to learn how to do over the course of a lifting career. You'll detrain, you'll be less practiced at that movement. And then when you come back in the gym, you'll still have a lot of your base strength, like say six to eight weeks later. But because you're detrained, you're actually opening yourself up to injuring yourself again because you don't have the same technique to tolerate the amount of strength that you have. Yeah, and this goes back to Tim Gabbett's acute to chronic workload ratio, basically saying that if you don't have a lot of baseline fitness and then you try something that's challenging, you're more likely to get hurt, right? Let's say that I never run and I sign up for marathon and I go run it. Likely I'm going to get hurt, right? Let's say I sign up for marathon and slowly build up my fitness over the course of time, then run the marathon, much less likely to get hurt, right? Now, if I'm weight training and I'm doing this four or five days a week, I squat twice a week, deadlift twice a week, and I get hurt, and all of a sudden, I can't really squat or deadlift for a couple of weeks. I detrain. My fitness goes down, right? And then when I start training heavy again, once I start feeling better, I'm going to be more at risk because I've detrained. I've got a little worse, less capacity, less tolerance. So when I return back to my lifting, I don't think it's the technique necessarily that's not there. Probably is. You've been training that for years, but your capacity is not, right? You've detrained. You're not used to doing these things as much. Your risk of injury is probably going to go up, and you have to be cautious to slowly ramp up over time. So what do you do? I cut that workout short. I just did some mobilization stuff, some moving around. I did some single leg RDLs with really light weight, like just stuff I could tolerate. The next week I went in and said, okay, I injured it on sumo deadlifts, but I said, okay, what can I do that's like a sumo deadlift that is gonna kind of give me some stimulus to this area, build some tissue resilience, but not severely trigger that pain. Well, for that day, I set up a rack sumo that was just below my knee and I did sets of two reps. And that was about what I could tolerate. I could tell that if I did much more than that, I was going to really trigger that pain. But guess what happened the next week? I lowered it down a notch and I was actually able to do 405 without, without much pain. Now I could feel it. It felt tight, but it wasn't in pain. You can get good at determining, okay, when is it pain that it's just you're aware of it versus, oh wow, this is pain that's making it worse. So I did that. And then the next week I was actually able to go one notch lower and pull 500 pounds. And then the next week, I was actually able to take it to the floor with a similar amount of weight. And then what I did was, instead of just going back to full on deadlifts, I started doing halting deadlifts. So I used a variation of the lift where I had to use less weight, but it still provided me stimulus to that range of motion. So a halting deadlift is where you pause uh, mid shin after you break the floor for like two or three count, and then you finish the lift. So I did that for a few weeks. And then I was yeah, I'm going to pause here. There's a lot to break down, but uh, this is great. This message is phenomenal. And I hope that people 
start to adopt this strategy when they have injuries. I think a lot of folks do this naturally. Obviously, a lot of folks I see uh, need a little help with this, right? But largely what he's explaining is that he got hurt and he knows that if he stops training, that's a bad thing. He also knows that if he stays active, it's going to help him with his rehab. So what does he do? Well, he uses his brain and he can figure out how to reduce some of the stress on that injury, but still get a training effect, right? And he's also talking a little bit about pain. So largely, if you push through a little bit of pain, he uses the word tolerable, which I think is a, a great word. I use it all the time with my athletes. So if you're doing a movement, it feels tolerable. The next day, you don't feel like garbage. You didn't overdo it. Make it worse, right? It's probably going to be beneficial for that area. And the other piece that sometimes confuses folks is like, should I be able to work through a little bit of pain while I'm training? The answer is most likely yes. I mean, if you have a medical red flag, if you rupture your pec, like, yeah, you got to go to a surgeon. If you have a, a broken bone, you're not trying to train through that. But if you have a strain injury, non-specific low back pain, whatever it is, the training is going to be beneficial to make that better over the course of time. A lot of research, low back, Achilles, patellar tendon, rotator cuff, all sorts of areas in the body that if you push through a little bit of pain, depending on the injury, right? Uh, generally speaking, if the movement feels tolerable to you, it's probably not going to change your long-term outcomes. So you're not going to hurt yourself further, but you get to maintain the strength that you built over the course of time a little bit better than doing nothing. And the other piece, and this depends on the study, but in some of these studies, if you push through some pain versus not pushing through any pain whatsoever, you get better a little bit faster. The thought being is like, all right, if I'm stressing this tissue, if I'm creating a little bit of pain, it's the exercise that's the medicine that's helping this heal. If I work into some pain, I'm probably getting the medicine in the right area. If I don't work through any pain, I might not be putting the medicine where I need it to be or maybe not enough medicine, all right? So it's good probably to work through a little bit of pain, right? Obviously, don't make, make sure you're not dead the next day. And over the course of time, as you feel better, just like Lane talked about, we just systematically increase the loads take the weight closer to the floor, try and get back to our normal training as much as possible based on your tolerance and how fast this thing heals. I was able to go back to deadlifting and I could still feel a little bit, but over the course of about 12 weeks, by the end of 12 weeks, no pain, didn't even notice it existed. But that was because I did. Good job, Lane. Way to heal. Good stuff. Did what's called exposure therapy. There's a psychological kind of analogy here. If you had a fear of spiders, the way to overcome that fear is to not place yourself in a locked room with a thousand spiders. That will actually be a traumatic event. So if you've injured yourself, you're in pain. Let's take the example of my adductor. If I'd gone in the next day, or if I'd gone in the next week and tried to pull 600 pounds for reps, I probably would have made it way, way worse. It would have been traumatic for that tissue. It was not recovered. It was not ready for that kind of load. But what if you just have a fear of spiders and you step into a room with one spider that's behind a glass case? You could probably stay in that room. And then over the course of time, maybe they move that case closer to you. And maybe at some point they take the case off. And at some point they put another spider in the room and then another. And what you're doing is over time, you're exposing yourself to something that you're afraid of, but you become less afraid, but you have to do it in a graded way. It's a great analogy, you know, and I think two things, right? So you just kind of use the word, but we would call that more of a graded exposure or progressive overload in physical therapy. Um, kind of the sciencey term would be mechanotransduction. Essentially, if you mechanically stimulate muscle, bone, ligament, whatever it is, it just makes it heal over the course of time. If you do too much, it can create a bunch of pain. I think a lot of that is probably because your body is trying to protect you. And after you have an injury, it's a trust building process to build back to what you're doing before, right? So from a tissue loading perspective, you have a fresh injury. It doesn't handle the loading. If you put too much stress on it, yes, that can create trouble. The other piece is there's probably is a psychological portion of this. All pain is created in your brain. So largely, if you just got an injury and your body's trying to protect you, 600 pound deadlift is pretty dang threatening, right? So if we throw that onto the body on that fresh injury, your brain is going to say, wow, this guy is an absolute lunatic. I don't trust him. Let's create a bunch of pain. We need to protect him, right? If you slowly ramp up over the course of time, we're going to respect the healing tissue, right? Which is good. We're going to build some adaptation, strengthen it up. But from the psychological perspective, we're decreasing that threat because we're building trust with our body. Your brain doesn't have to create a bunch of pain, essentially just because you've slowly shown your body it can handle this, right? And I know it's not a perfect analogy, but training and recovering from injury works very similarly. You have to back yeah. off 
to a point where you don't have increasing levels of pain, but still do something that stimulates the area to build that tissue resilience. Because by exactly. training the area, you're getting blood flow, you are stimulating some of those things to help repair and recover that tissue. So yeah. this is a similar thing I did with my hips when I was squatting. I had probably two years where left and right hip both gave me all kinds of problems to the point where I couldn't Same. squat below parallel with 135 pounds without a 10 out of 10 pain. So what did I do? Even that's bad so what squat movement can I do that doesn't trigger this pain so much that it makes it worse? And what that ended up being was I did a slow tempo with a lower load pin squat where I paused at the bottom. Now it was probably about eight, nine inches above parallel. I couldn't even get close to parallel. Okay. But I did that pin squat for a few weeks with like 350 pounds. And then after a couple of weeks, I moved the pin down, increased the weight a little bit, did a few more weeks, moved pin down, increased the weight and so on and so forth. And within 16 weeks, I was doing full squats with 500 pounds below parallel with almost no hip pain whatsoever. Again, good job, Lane. That's awesome. Uh, I'm assuming that he probably had some hip labral pathology, femoral tabular impingement syndrome. I've had a lot of this myself in the past and similar to Lane, I don't squat nearly as much as he does. Um, I've done the same thing. So for me, I had to cut my range of motion, maybe doing box squats for a little bit. And then I just worked to different variations that didn't hurt. So front squats tended to feel a little bit better for me because I'm a little more upright, requires a little less hip flexion over the course of time. I work my way to a safety squat bar. And to this day, I still feel way better with a safety squat bar than I do with a barbell back squat. So I tend to do the safety squat bar more frequently just because it feels way better. But the idea, just like Lane said, is we're basically, it's funny, I'm looking at Lane while he's staring at me right now. Um, <clears throat> you have to lessen the load to the point where you feel like you're training in a tolerable way. And as you start to make progress over the course of time, you just start to ramp up and that can be done in a variety of ways, but that's the basic idea behind what I do with folks every single day from a rehab perspective. It's a good advice there. If you've incurred an injury or something like that, first thing to look at is reducing the load, reduce the load, reduce the volume. If that's not sufficient. Really good point. I will say that's nuanced because when I rehab someone, I actually increase the volume. I want to actually put more stress through that joint, through that area, oftentimes I'm telling them to hit that muscle more frequently than they currently do that has the injury, but I definitely agree with reducing that load. We're trying to drive an adaptation, so we don't want to stop stressing that, right? We actually want to try to stress it more, but in a different way that's well tolerated. So reducing the loads, very smart. Keeping the volume the same or slightly higher, I think is good. Just have to find movements that are going to strengthen that tissue that don't aggravate it too much over time. Efficient look at reducing the rate of tempo because sometimes since force ah, another big one sorry to stop it so much but slowing down the tempo is probably the next thing i'll do for folks if load isn't working and usually from a load perspective we're trying to increase the reps so people will be forced to decrease the load and then when you slow things down it forces the load to go down even more so it tends to make things a lot more comfortable when people have injuries forces mass times acceleration sometimes reducing the velocity of the lift can reduce the pain sensitivity. Definitely. So if reducing the weight doesn't work, try slowing down the tempo. If that doesn't work, try slowing down the tempo with a pause at the bottom of the Another lift. good one. If that doesn't work, then try modifying the range of motion. You could also combine those things where you're reducing the load, you're doing- Do you think Lane watches fitnesspainfree.com? It was slower tempo, you're modifying the range of motion, and if those things don't work, then you have to look at changing your exercise selection and looking for something that still stimulates that area, but doesn't cause pain and doesn't make that pain response worse. Funny, man. He just like summed up my entire business there in about 30 seconds. Um, but yeah, I think that's amazing, right? Try to play around the load. That's not working. You can play around a little bit more with the exercise selection. And then, you know, you basically use what works. And I'm telling you better than any exercise better than definitely any stretching, better than any cold plunge, better than any massage, which by the way, massage doesn't really have any evidence to support it reducing injuries. Exposure therapy is what got me back and allowed me to end up winning a world championship. And even now I use it. Last week was the first time I got back into squatting like higher reps. So for most part over the last few years, I, I couldn't tolerate much volume. Uh, so we started doing 
What I will say is that I just kind of said the opposite of this. I think for most folks, they're load intolerant, meaning that heavy loads don't feel good. They can't tolerate it. For other people, it can it can tend to be the volume. So for Lane here, it seems like higher rep stuff tends to kind of get him painful. And I've seen some of his high rep stuff. He's doing like 500 for 12. There's a crazy amount of weight for the squat. So I would still say that intensity is quite high. Um, but yeah, it depends on the individual. So if you have a person like Lane who can't tolerate volume, we probably have to pull back on that. Uh, for most folks, they don't tolerate the load. So you have to pull back and load a little bit. So sets of eight on squats. And last week I hit two sets of eight with 450 pounds on squats. It felt great. Yeah. I had plenty left in the tank. And I'm like, yeah, here we go. I'm gonna get back. I'm gonna squat over 650 pounds again. And then all this past week, my adductors were so sore. I was not able to go in and get my normal session in, but I didn't force it because I know, hey, I have not trained up to that recovery level yet. My body is not accustomed to that recovery level yet. I have to train it to get it there. But I'm yeah, that makes total sense. If you start ramping up the uh, the volume in your program, you start getting that excessive soreness. I think that's one of those things where you should just take caution moving forward. I've had this happen all the time where let's say I do a whole bunch of squatting. I increase the amount of sets or reps I do. I have a lot of soreness. A couple of days later, soreness is still there, start deadlifting, and then I strain my glute, right? It does happen. We have to respect that when we're feeling that in the gym. I'm going to do this week. I gave myself time to rest. I'm going to go in. I'm going to do the same session, do sets of eight, but I'm going to back off the load, let my body get used to it get used to the recovery capacity, and then I will slowly work my way back up and I have full confidence. I'll be back doing sets of eight with 500 pretty soon. All right, guys, Make a path. I put the study links in the description. If you like the video, like. All right, thank you very much, Lane. So I do wanna just give you a little bit of my biases and everything before we wrap up here. I've been following Lane Norton, Bio Lane for a couple of years now, and I really, really like his stuff. It's very evidence-based, and his main expertise is generally going to be nutrition, although obviously he's pretty well-versed in rehabby type stuff. He's a very high-level athlete in powerlifting. So right off the bat, I already like this guy, right? I'm biased in a good way towards him. One of the reasons why I like doing these reaction videos is, A, I get to expose really good people to the rest of the world. So hopefully my audience goes and checks out Lane Norton. They like his stuff. He's got a lot of really good information, right? That's going to be a big part of it. The other thing that I see frequently is that you have experts within a given realm, right? And then they make a video where they step outside of their expertise. And sometimes information is got off, right? Sometimes you have stuff that makes me question the individual as an actual expert. They say something that's related to, let's say, rehab, when their typical expertise is nutrition. And I'm like, wow, this person's so off. It makes me question everything they say about nutrition, right? Um, but for Lane anyway, I thought that was actually quite articulate. I think it was very evidence-based. I think he's actually true with most of the things he's saying. Obviously, it's very nuanced discussion. This is not what he does every day of his life. He doesn't help people get out of pain. He doesn't help to prevent injuries, right? So I think it was a really good video. Very hopeful. Um, I would definitely recommend checking out his channel if you haven't yet. If you guys actually like this format with reactions, this is new to me, let me know. I've been trying to do this for a while, but never got it off the ground. So just let me know in the comments. If you like these videos, hit that like button and subscribe if you do enjoy it. And I'll see you on the next video.